So good morning, everyone. I welcome you here at this today morning session. My name is Kristina Karshe, and I have the pleasure to moderate and to chair this uh, morning session with you together. I would like to introduce you Professor Vanga Dokovsky from Macedonia, from the uh, serial, oh, what is the name? Um, oh, the, uh, the um, Serial and Method University. Sorry, for Skopje. And we have the pleasure that uh, Professor Dukowski will have a lecture on um, implication and um, connections between COVID-19 and uh, alternative dispute resolutions in the field of the international private law. And uh, yes, you know the protocol, we will have the chance to um, raise questions and both uh, in a written form and also in an oral form. So I hope we will enjoy the um, presentation. Professor Dokovsky, you have the floor. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Good morning from Skopje. I'm very happy for the opportunity to be here and to present some of my thoughts on international commercial arbitration and the implication of the COVID-19 on alternative dispute uh, resolution. I know that uh, it's quite challenging to have an online session on Friday, especially after having more than four months online lectures, but I'm very happy to have more than 69 participants today and to listen one of the site of the COVID-19 and private international law. I'm very happy once again to be part of this summer university, this time not in Istanbul, but this time from my home. And we will see how the, the whole process of digitalization now works in the field of alternative dispute resolution. Back in 2017, everything was very easy for me to go to Turkey, just to catch the plane and to be part of the summer university when the main topic was, when the main topic uh, was the rights, the rights of refugees and uh, migrant workers, uh, I have uh, prepared some slides for you and also very short questions so we can have some interaction during my presentation, just to see how are we dealing with the questions of private international law in the field of COVID nineteen. I know that you are all with question marks why someone who is working with private international law, international arbitration, both commercial and investment, is dealing also with uh, human rights. But you will see that there are many questions that are connected between private international law and human rights, especially these days when you have a lot of travel restrictions. It, it's not so easy to travel between uh, states, for example, for me, it is impossible to travel within the European Union. I can only travel with Macedonian passports to Turkey and to Albania right now without any, uh, any PCR negative tests. But it is impossible for me, for example, to travel to Germany or if I want to go to, to France, for example. It is also impossible for me to go to Greece also. And imagine what will happen if, if I am a lawyer and if I have a scheduled meeting or a hearing in Greece or in ICC, International Chamber of Commerce in Paris, then you will see that we have a lot of problems once again connected between the private international arbitration and the COVID-19. And finally, what will happen if we have a foreign arbitral award that we need to recognize here in uh, Skopje? And one of the parties raised the objection that he never agreed to have a virtual hearing whether in such situation you have some problems with the public policy standard or not, or, or what will happen if you have uh, cyber criminal during the, uh, during the presentation of some documents under privilege during the arbitral proceedings via, via online. So you have a lot, of, a lot of questions, but at the present stage, I'm not so sure that we have all the answers. So thank you very much for your kind invitation, just to share the thoughts for private international law and what is going to happen uh, these days. The topic of my presentation is the COVID-19 and the impact of on 
alternative dispute resolution. And I believe that right now you can see the presentation or not. I think yes, right? Yes, that's perfect. Perfect. So uh, before we start, I would kindly ask you to use your imagination in order to imagine how it is to be right now in Istanbul and not to sit in your homes and to be part of the uh, to be in one of the buildings of um, Istanbul University. Uh, just imagine that you're in a city when, where you have Galatasaray Tower and uh, you have a huge queue that, of people that are waiting just to go in and to take pictures. Uh, just imagine that right now uh, there is uh, no restrictions and you can freely travel and there is no need for social distancing. Uh, imagine that you're in tax on Taksim and that you can take pictures of the famous of, uh, of the famous tram. Now use your imagination that you can meet some of your professors that you read all of their books. And that's what happened to me back in 2017 when uh, Professor Vasilakakis was also part of the summer university. Let's go further and imagine that there is no social distancing and you have the privilege to meet in person with the founder of this summer university and to enjoy uh, on the Bosphorus and just to spend great time in Istanbul. Then imagine that you have also the privilege to meet uh, one of the persons that are strongly working on this summer university to happen with Professor Olcher and just to, to say thank you for all of the efforts and for the organization. And just imagine finally that you are in this beautiful room with this beautiful academic saloon where you can share your thoughts on different aspects with students from all around the world. And you see that the power of imagination is strong and that uh, in these difficult times you can use those um, you can use that power just to share how it is to be part of this great summer university. I hope that all of you will have the chance to be present in this room and to see what is going at Istanbul University and uh, how this summer university is progressing every year. But now let's go on the topic and uh, see what is happening with the alternative dispute resolution in the light of COVID-19. There are several aspects of the, of the crisis of COVID-19 in the field of uh, private international law, in the field of international commercial arbitration, and also in the field of investment arbitration. Why I have chosen this topic is just to show that there is also another part, not just a criminal part, not just the part of human rights of law, but it, it is also a part of private international law and uh, most of you in the near future, after finishing your schools, you're going to work with private international law and investment commercial, uh, invest, both investment and commercial arbitration. And I'm always very happy for Professor Sozor to introduce me to this summer university and for giving me a chance to be part of this university for the third year. If we analyze what is going in the world with uh, the COVID-19 crisis and epidemic, you will see, for example, in the education that everything is locked down. In uh, Macedonia, you cannot go to the universities, for example, for classes. If you want to take an exam, then you need to schedule a separate uh, meeting with the professor and after that to attend, uh, to attend the exam. Uh, but you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of commercial cases that are dealing right now, starting from uh, March, 2020, and not just in in Macedonia, but also in France, in in Germany, in every country of the world, in Hungary. But how is going to develop with the proceedings that are ongoing is one of the most important question. For example, you have one uh, you have a case that is already commenced arbitral proceedings back in, uh, in January. And imagine that you have a scheduled hearing in June in Paris. If you have a, a hearing place in Paris, and if you have one part is from Macedonia, the other party is from Hungary, and they want to have arbitration in Paris, then the party from Hungary is free to go to France, but the party from Macedonia cannot even travel to France 
to, un to attend that meeting. So one of the problem is how is going to resolve this, this problem and how are we going to create a nice uh, place for everybody so they can present their own cases. Or what will happen if you have, for example, a lawyer that needs to travel to Macedonia just to, to have some deposition from uh, witnesses or just to examine all the evidence. Once again, it will be impossible. And we were under lockdown for almost two months. Nothing was working. So how is he going to prepare if someone is lawyer from Skopje and have a, uh, arbitral proceedings, for, ex for example, in, um, in Great Britain? How is he going to prepare for its own, um, own case? Uh, that is uh, very interesting how it's going to, to impact right now the COVID-19 on the ongoing cases. The second very important field is the field for the upcoming cases. Why this is so important? Because after you have all the travel bans, after you have bans for, ban for, uh, uh, for traveling and for free trade, it is impossible to export medical devices in some countries. And with all infrastructure pro uh, projects, then we will see that once again, there are many cases that will start to going in front of arbitration, in front of um, other uh, dispute uh, methods. Uh, what is going to happen with the with the Wiesmeyer cases and are you allowed to introduce the Wiesmeyer as one of defenses? And finally, what is going to happen in the field of recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards? This is also very interesting questions because sometimes you need to deal with recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral award that is rendered in a country that not is not within the country where the enforcement is sought. For example, imagine that you have um, arbitral award that uh, was rendered in Great Britain against, uh, against uh, defendant who is uh, from, um, from a respondent who is from Macedonia. And uh, the party from Great Britain needs to initiate the court procedure for recognition and enforcement of that British award in front of Macedonian courts. And the real question here is whether the Macedonian court will intervene within the merits of the dispute, or it can just uh, read the outcome of the case and to see whether there is a problem with the public policy or due process. So that's why it is very important also to, to see what is happening with the recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards. There are already several cases here in uh, Skopje where the recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral award was denied on the grounds of uh, public policy and we will see what was the reason on, on that. So uh, if we want to understand what is happening in uh, 2020, then we will see that um, the way how we practice law is completely changed, both in uh, short and long terms. In short terms, you have uh, digitalization of the procedures, and on long terms, you have uh, high chance and high probability to have a lot of new cases that are coming in front of the courts. Then we will see that uh, also the lawyers and the clients will differently approach to different dispute resolution uh, mechanism and how are they going to benefit from one or another because they are free to choose in which, uh, which forum they want to protect their own uh, rights. The COVID-19 currently is impacting some of the most developed uh, area of, um, of trade, of employment and consumer claims. For example, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, you have a huge number of uh, employment contracts that have been terminated. For example, in Macedonia, starting from February, from April 2020 till the end of July 2020, 12,000 workers have ended uh, their workplace and they are on the free market right now. It is impossible on the job market to find a job at this moment. So the first thing is, uh, are the employees uh, and the employers allowed to initiate arbitral proceedings in order to resolve their disputes? 
if we analyze our law, Macedonian law, then we will see that the answer is clear, yes. But are there some restrictions? Yes, because right now it is almost impossible to initiate arbitral proceedings because most of the, of the collective agreements have been terminated. Then we're going to consumer claims. If we are analyzing the consumer claims, you will see that there are many people that right now are unable to use what they have already purchased. Why? Because uh, it is impossible to, to have a free trade, at least in some countries. And uh, if you have, for example, a travel arrangement and a travel agreement, that agreement is already terminated. There are more than 500,000 people in Macedonia. Uh, they have travel agreements. All of their travel agreements are terminated. And the state right now is giving the amount of 50% of the payment of the travel agreement so they can use in 2021. The third element is the question of force majeure. Can we deem uh, COVID-19 as a force majeure or not? Uh, is there any restrictions or not? Can you invoke force majeure defense? Why are you not fulfilling your obligations or not? Or for example, can you just terminate your contract on the grounds of uh, force majeure? You have uh, big investment projects right now that they are terminated because it is impossible to, uh, to have enough funds to proceed with the projects uh, and uh, to have enough equipment. And finally, you have export bonds. For example, uh, the ban for uh, medical equipment. Uh, we were struggling as a country to find uh, enough breathing machines. So it was the ban for medical equipment. Uh, was one of the main uh, topics in our country, how we can uh, resolve this uh, dispute. So as you see, you have a lot of different areas where COVID-19 is direct, is having a direct impact of, of that, uh, of that uh, scenario. Now, in order for me to have a more clear picture of how are you dealing with um, arbitration, I will kindly ask you, to, is it possible this link that I have sent to panelists now to share with all, with all, yes, with all panelists and attendants. I would kindly ask all attendants to open this form. You will see this form as a Microsoft form. And I would like to talk with you on five different questions but in order to have more interactive session, uh, would you please be so kind first to open the first questions, the first question and to answer what are the alternative dispute resolution methods that you are familiar with. Uh, here you have multiple answer option and after you click all of the answers, you go at the bottom of the page and then just click submit. I think that you you can already see that, right? Is it possible for you to to open the link? And after you open the link, you can answer the questions. Great, I have already several responses. I think that this will be much more interactive for you. Just to see what are the opinions. So let's have one or two minutes just to just to answer the questions. We have already received seven responses. You have multiple correct choices here. This 
see how are you, when you're answering, I'm already getting all the results. Just on the first question, I will be very happy. No, not the whole, the whole questions, just the first question. What are the alternative dispute methods? What is your opinion? To see whether there is something that we need to clear up before we proceed with the, with the essence of, of the question. Great, we have received 19 answers. So let's see what are the answers. Is litigation one of the alternative dispute resolution methods? The answer here is no. Uh, litigation is a court uh, proceedings without having the opportunity uh, to interfere within the procedure. Uh, that is the main difference between different type of alternative dispute resolution methods and with the litigation. When you are dealing with litigation, then it is impossible uh, to choose, for example, the procedural rules. When the court is seated, then the whole procedure is governed by the Lex 40. On the other hand, in different alternative dispute resolution methods, you have the opportunity freely to choose the place of arbitration, and also you can choose the Lex the Lex um, Arbitri. So the litigation is not um, is not alternative dispute resolution method. Uh, litigation is a court procedure, and as a court uh, proced uh, procedure, it is always very personal. Uh, here on the Balkans, the people are preferring litigation um, as a method for resolution of uh, their disputes. It is not an alternative dispute method, but still people are preferring to go in front of the courts to be very emotional and to get uh, their money or what they're, what, what they're asking to be back. So the first question, whether litigation is, um, is uh, alternative dispute resolution method uh, or no, the answer here is no. But what for baseball arbitration? Definitely. Baseball arbitration is not a sport arbitration. Baseball arbitration is a different type of arbitration where you have just one round of uh, hearings and after that you're getting, you're getting the award. Mediation definitely is an, is an alternative dispute resolution method. It is a, it is a very popular one, uh, but uh, still you will see that there is a, uh, there is a difference between, um, uh, between mediation and um, arbitration. Uh, negotiations are also method for alternative dispute settlement. Now, they are quite often used between large companies. How are they going to resolve their disputes? And uh, usually the CEO are dealing with the uh, negotiations. Expert determination is a very interesting and very popular method for alternative dispute resolution, and especially in the field of construction. If you're familiar with the FIDIC contracts, then you will see that they all have dispute adjudication board as a first step before, go, before going to arbitration. So they are very, um, they are quite often used as an um, alternative method for expert determination. And uh, especially if you are dealing with uh, infrastructure projects and if you are dealing with um, uh, for example, with the construction of a hospital or a road, whatever. Uh, classification is not a dispute uh, method. Classification is uh, one of the methods for, uh, for determining the type of the dispute. For example, in private international law, we are using classification or characterization in order to show whether this is a contractual or non-contractual obligations because the um, choice of law rule is different for contractual or for non-contractual obligations. We are using classification in order to determine whether this is um, family relations, uh, you have family relations, or is this just a part of contractual uh, relations? Or if we are also dealing classification when we are talking about something that is unknown in our legal system, uh, for example, uh, we don't have trusts, 
as a, as a legal form, as a legal institute in our system. So that's why classification is not a dispute method, but it is a method for, uh, for showing and for determining uh, which choice of law rule are you, you are going to apply in certain situation. And finally, the executor. Executory is not an is not alternative dispute method, but uh, it is rather a procedure for recognition and enforcement of uh, foreign arbitral and uh, foreign arbitral and court decision. For example, if uh, I have a decision from Turkey, and if I want that decision to be enforced in uh, Skopje, then I need to go through uh, the proceedings of executor. For example, three months ago, there is a very famous decision from Turkey. It's uh, about um, uh, rec it's about recognition and enforcement of um, award from Turkish court from Court of Istanbul, um, and the amount is between uh, two hundred thousand and two hundred and fifty thousand um, um, US dollars. Uh, the dispute was about. Um, some of the problems with the cars that were imported from uh, from uh, Turkey, but at the end the Turkish side won the case, and now the whole process is pending in front of the court of first instance in um, Skopje. They have already granted enforcement of that decision, but now there is appeal in front of the court of second instance in Skopje. So as a C grade, you all have. Um, uh, good, very good knowledge on the types of um, alternative dispute resolution methods. So we have baseball arbitration, mediation, negotiation, and expert determination. Arbitration, of course, is uh, alternate dispute resolution method. So uh, after we are all familiar with different with different um, alternate dispute resolution method. one hmm. why it, it move so sorry once yeah uh, we have arbitration baseball arbitration we have uh, mediation online dispute resolution um, and expert uh, determination um, one of the main impact of the the COVID nineteen crisis was to go in everything to go virtual. So if we see what is happening with the virtual negotiations, then we will see that there are no so many problems in this uh, in uh, this. Uh, in this type of uh, resolving disputes because the parties just they continue to seek to seek to negotiate the resolution of their dispute why this was um, so easy for them uh, because the ceo of the companies they have their meetings already uh, via zoom or via skype so for them it was very easy to proceed with their virtual negotiations and uh, today they are just going uh, not limited to video conference and teleconference, but they're also doing their uh, Zoom uh, meetings and they prefer to have video and telephone, telephone conference calls rather than face-to-face -face meetings because they don't need to travel from one place to another place and where when they have the possibility to negotiate between themselves, then it's quite easy for them to, to reach agreement also via uh, via uh, video conference call, uh, there are still um, there are still some challenges in this in this area because uh, very uh, very often you can use uh, one of the guerrilla tactics to to prolong your uh, proceedings. Uh, we will talk a little bit later about the guerrilla tactics and this uh, COVID nineteen crisis is ideal for some of the parties to invoke guerrilla tactics and to postpone all of the proceedings just to claim that their right to be heard is violated and they cannot prepare their, uh, their defense. Uh, what happened in the field of mediation? Uh, everything so far uh, was so good. If, for example, in Australia, it is very common to, to have a mediation and to, to conduct a virtual mediation between the parties. And um, it is very popular just to have a third uh, neutral person who is going to 
assist the parties to reach an agreement. Uh, be very careful that, that there is a, a huge difference between mediation and arbitration uh, based on the nature of the award. For example, in uh, mediation, the parties are uh, going uh, through the whole process just to get an agreement and they're getting their agreement, their settlement, uh, while they're helped uh, from another third party. On the other hand, when we are talking about arbitration, you have, arbit you, uh, you have a sole arbitrator or arbitral panel that is going to resolve the, uh, the dispute and to render an arbitral award, and that arbitral award has the same effects as that is uh, judicata from the court uh, proceedings. Uh, in uh, for cross-border dispute now mediation is boosting and the real the real question why this is boosting is thanks to the uh, new singapore mediation convention are you familiar with the singapore mediation convention so just raise your hand if you're familiar or if you want to intervene while we are talking about uh, mediation Does somebody of you who is here today have ever heard about Singapore Mediation Convention? Because there was a huge event in Turkey, for, also for Singapore Mediation Convention and for Mauritius Convention. So the, uh, the Singapore Mediation Convention is a convention that was signed last year in Singapore. And uh, the idea behind this convention is uh, to promote mediation on the scale that once you have a mediation agreement and once you have agreement between the parties after they conduct the mediation, you can go in front of the court of other state that is signatory to the Singapore Mediation Convention and that to enforce such um, such agreement. The, the huge problem with the mediation before this Singapore Convention was that it was almost impossible to go in front of the other courts of other country and just to ask, ask for a court to enforce uh, that uh, agreement, but not like in arbitration. But uh, right now with the new Singapore Mediation Convention, the idea is to boost the uh, mediation on the way that once you have uh, settlement between the parties, you can use that settlement in order to go in front of the courts and to invoke the Singapore Mediation um, Convention. Uh, there is something that is, I'm not so sure about Singapore Mediation uh, Convention, and that is that I'm not so sure that the states are going to sign the Singapore Mediation Convention. It's, uh, um, this is a document that result from the UNCITRAL working group, uh, but uh, although there are many countries that signed the Singapore Con Mediation Convention, there are less than five countries that ratified the conventions. It, convention, I know that they need a lot of time just to, um, to decide are they're going to, to enforce mediation uh, awards or not. For expert determination, um, it is quite usually for expert determination when you have, for example, dispute education board to have only one meeting, even before the crisis, the COVID crisis. Right now, everything is uh, virtual and all the hearings, everything is um, going uh, online. Um, you know, the, the, the whole process of expert determination is very informal because you don't need to be a lawyer in, on, in order to be uh, an expert in that uh, dispute education board. For example, if you're having a construction um, dispute, I'm sure that you, will, you would like to have and you will prefer to have engineer and uh, as, a, as a person who serves as expert. Um, they're all using all the you know, digitalization process of the expert determination and it, it is very easy for them. And now we are coming to the challenging part and the challenging part is arbitration. Why this is a very challenging part? Because uh, arbitration uh, from its nature is a consensual dispute resolution process. So the parties, they choose the place of arbitration, they choose the applicable law and they choose the arbitrators. Uh, they can choose a single or sole arbitrator or they can choose an arbitral um, tribunal. 
why um, why arbitration? Why are we focusing on arbitration? Because um, unlike other dispute resolution methods, the final goal of arbitration is to have arbitral award, and that arbitral award is having the same legal effect and as a court decision. So um, that's one point. The, another point is that you have a lot of countries in the world. Uh, where you can go in front of their courts and where you can invoke arbitral award and seek for enforcement uh, for recognition and enforcement of that award. So arbitration, it is true that it's a very flexible one and very informal, um, informal uh, proceedings. And uh, usually everything is on a written phase. Face-to-face uh, -face contact with the arbitral tribunal is very limited even before the COVID-19 crisis and everything was on the written documents. So uh, the, the real impact of the COVID-19 crisis on arbitration was the whole process of digitalization of the written process, the submission of the, of the, of the documents, because one of the main question is when the arbitral proceeding is deemed to be commenced whether it should be when the other party received the request for arbitration or when the arbitral institution received, um, received that, um, received that uh, request for arbitration, then what is going to happen if we have um, uh, discovery? For example, discovery is a very familiar concept in, the, um, in the common law countries, but discovery and fishing expedition is uh, prohibited in um, in a civil law countries. And uh, we are facing with, uh, the, with the dilemma whether we should allow some uh, document production or not based on the document discovery of, from the uh, common law perspective. And that's why we have IBA um, rules on taking of um, evidence, but it is something that is completely completely uh, different. Why arbitration is so popular? Once again, we will need to see the answer from your side. And could you once again go in terms? Yes. Why is it so popular to have the recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards right now? So. Could you just now start to answering the second question? Yes. The second question is recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards. Is governed by which document? New York Convention from 1958, Uncitral Model Law, Singapore Convention of the Vienna Convention also known as the CISG. What is your opinion? I see that you have already answered that question, at least some of you. Uh, the document that is uh, ratified by more than 190 countries from the whole world, world is the New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. Uh, the UNCITRAL model law is it is just a model law in the international commercial arbitration and the countries are using UNCITRAL model law in order to, to adopt their national, national law on arbitration. Singapore Convention, we already stressed that is for mediation agreements and the CISG is for Vienna Convention on International Sales of Goods. So uh, most of the, the most ratified international instrument in the field of um, private law is the New York Convention from 1958. Uh, and uh, we can see that, that thanks to this, uh, thanks, wait, I have checked. Yes. Ali, yes, 
definitely the state courts are taking so much time to and it's much it's more expensive for a corporation and that's why they choose to go in uh, front of uh, arbitration this is an excellent observation uh, this is why they're going in front of arbitration because they want to save money but uh, they also want to save their reputation because when you're going in front of arbitration the core principle in commercial arbitration is the principle of confidentiality so everything stays uh, within the room. Uh, nothing, go, nothing goes in the front of um, the public. Uh, you have a lot of arbitration cases and the business community will never see what is the problems with some of the companies. Uh, but there is a huge difference in the side of investment arbitration. Uh, is it fair to have confidentiality in investment arbitration? What is your opinion? Is it fair to have investment to have a confidentiality in investment arbitration while you are involving the public interest? For example, in uh, investment arbitration, as one of the parties respondent is always the state. So just imagine you are using the principle of confidentiality and nothing's go in front of the public. You are using public money to finance that proceedings. So what is your opinion for, for investment arbitration? Is it possible to have the same principle from commercial arbitration as uh, the principle of confidentiality to go together with the, princi with the same principle to be applied in front of the in, in, you know, investment arbitration? What is your thoughts on that point? Ali or whoever want to intervene in this? Just your opinion. What is your opinion on um, on um, investment arbitration? Is it possible to have the same principle as confidentiality? Of course not. You cannot apply the same principle from commercial arbitration to investment arbitration. Because in investment arbitration, you need to know um, what is the dispute, who are the parties, and why the claimant is invoking um, the, the breach of fair and equitable treatment. So that is the main purpose why uh, the Mauritius Convention was uh, signed. But unfortunately, um, that convention is not ratified by many countries uh, from the world. So if once again, we go back to uh, to arbitration, then we will see that it is definitely that arbitration is a very informal. I have analyzed several institution, arbitral institution, and I just noticed that all of them are using uh, virtual sessions and they have already introduced some of their online dispute resolution technologies for example, Akita, Akika was the first one, then we have the International Chamber of Commerce in Paris. So everything is conducted virtually right now in um, International Chamber of Commerce in uh, Paris. All the, um, all, the, all the process for document production, uh, the administrative work is uh, online. Uh, there is also possibility for virtual hearings based on Article 25 from the ICC uh, rules, but uh, International Chamber of Commerce was one of the institutions that was very well prepared for their for their uh, for the COVID nineteen nine, um, nineteen pandemic. What is your opinion? Why is it so important? Why um, International Chamber of Commerce was so good uh, prepared for virtual hearings? Are you familiar with? Uh, some protest in back in France two years ago or one year ago before the pandemic because Paris is one of the most uh, desirable places for arbitration what is your opinion on that what happened and why ICC Paris was so good prepared for the whole pandemic let me use the chat. Excellent, Farus. Farus, right? Yes. Excellent. Uh, right. The Yellow West protests. Uh, thanks to the Yellow West protest, everything in 
ICC was already prepared to be virtual. So everything was, even before the, the pandemic, was prepared to go online and everything was going in front of, um, of online uh, meetings. So that that's, is the idea uh, why, um, why to go in front of um, arbitration. Uh, so excellent, uh, Farouch, for, uh, for your observation. That's the reason why ICC Paris was so good uh, in, this, in this area. Uh, now I'm reading the previous question and they, yes, not to spend much more money. It's uh, making common rules. Um, the answer is uh, clear, yes. You have different uh, different rules in different arbitral institution, but as I already said, um, the main idea is to save, um, to save money. Uh, after we see that in Paris, it, it in the ICC Chamber of Paris was very, let me, yes, was very good prepare. Uh, now we will see that uh, there is an ICC note on um, ICC notes uh, for virtual hearings and how they respond um, the crisis. Uh, if we go to Hong Kong, we will see that uh, one of the first uh, places they introduced the. Ich um, the online hearings, online mediation, and online arbitration, online filing uh, system. Uh, London Court of International Arbitration already set up an online filing system, so everything can be sent uh, via, via online for all the new uh, cases. So the main uh, characteristic of arbitration is uh, the flexibility of the whole process, but uh, there is uh, the, the outbreak of the COVID-19 disrupt the normal proceedings, especially uh, when uh, one of the parties invoked the impossibility to travel and to attend um, uh, the hearing. Although uh, the main characteristic of arbitration is the contractual nature, you will see that a lot of parties now are invoking the COVID-19 pandemic as a guerrilla tactic to postpone the, the hearings. Uh, why are they doing so? Because one of uh, the idea of the parties is just to prolong the proceedings and eventually to see whether they can maybe agree on some of the parts of their disputes or if the claimant failed in insolvency or they just uh, want to, to obstruct the, the proceedings and to create uh, some grounds for invoking the due process law. For emergency arbitrators, I'm not sure that today we can deal with them and how the COVID-19 pandemic impact the emergency arbitrators. Why it is so important to have emergency arbitrators? Because uh, in, uh, in arbitral proceedings, sometimes you need to, to have an interim measure. And uh, uh, the jurisdiction for issuing an interim measure is um, both on state courts and on arbitral uh, tribunals. But there is a loop between the day of initiation of the arbitral proceedings and the day of, com and the day of um, constitution of the arbitral tribunal. So who is going to issue um, interim measure if there is not yet an arbitral tribunal that is already constituted on one side and you don't want to go in front of the courts. So that's why many of the arbitral institutions, they introduce emergency arbitrators as um, arbitrators who are going to deal with the question of interim measures for the period of initiation and commencement of the arbitral proceedings till the constitution of the arbitral, uh, arbitral tribunal. And it is very popular during this COVID-19 pandemic uh, to just to, um, to ask one person to issue an interim uh, measure. Um, why is it always good idea to have alternatives that uh, in in-person hearings? In litigation, you always have an in-person hearings, but in arbitration, the process is not uh, common uh, used as a method for, um, for hearings. Uh, you can reduce time and costs because you can, uh, uh, you, can save so you can save money on travel and um, accommodation. You can also have a witness for legal proceedings uh, to have evidence via online link. Uh, 
then the cloud can be also extend to all parties to a matter and uh, while we are having a travel bans uh, and measures in force globally today the virtual hearings are very uh, very uh, often used as um, step in arbitration uh, the whole the whole um, impact of uh, the COVID-19 crisis, we can see on uh, this one slide. What is the, the impact of the COVID-19? The impact of the COVID-19 crisis in the field of private, uh, of private law is the increasing demand for amicable methods of dispute resolution. So people are trying to avoid court proceedings and they're trying to resolve their dispute be, uh, without invoking the state, um, the state courts because uh, it was correctly observed, uh, the state proceedings is quite long and it takes a lot of, uh, and it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of time. Uh, then you are, then we are dealing with the question of digitalization of arbitration. And yes, what is happening with the, the second impact is the digitalization of the arbitration. We already see that now almost everything is online. I have found some, um, some information for, uh, for Turkey. Turkey is also the Istanbul, Chamber, Istanbul um, Arbitration Court is quite reliable on technology. They're using technology in order to present their their cases, they're using practice round. I just noticed that uh, uh, they have already instructed several several guidelines. How are they going to develop the best practices for virtual hearings? And I can see that uh, uh, they are doing guidelines and they are doing protocols. Um, they are doing some specific uh, communication protocol for paperless arbitration and the procedure for selection of the online platform. And that is what is happening uh, within Turkey and how are they they're preparing. Yes, I, I, I found one decision of the Council of Judges and Prosecutors dated on March 30, 2020, that all non-emergency court hearings are, are were, were postponed at least to the 30th of April, 2020. And then pursuant to presidential degree 2020-79, certain measures regarding enforcement and bankruptcy proceedings uh, were uh, not in place until 30 of um, April. I also found that uh, pursuant to one an omnibus law published in the official gazette, all time periods relating to origination, exercise and termination of any rights included the statute of limitation of the prescription time, the terms for initiation a lawsuit or, or enforcement of proceedings, filing an application, complaint or objections. They were stayed from March 13 till April 30. And there is a new, there was a new presidential degree until 15 of June that they postponed all, all coral, all, all court hearings. I will just give you information what is happening with the Istanbul Chamber of Commerce Arbitration and Mediation Center. Uh, they all work remotely since 23rd of March, 2020. And they are 24 seven available by email and phone. And everything is conducted via, via email. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, um, yeah. So that is what is happening with the, with the Turkish uh, arbitration center and they're still entitled to resort everything to emergency arbitrator during the, uh, during the procedure. Uh, because I believe that we are running out of time. I will just go quickly once again on the Microsoft forms and just to see where you can see the uh, due process provision. The third, the, third, uh, in the third provision that is quite often to be breached is the, is the uh, due process. How are you going to deal with the, with the due process and uh, what is going to happen 
if one of the parties invoke um, the, the due process, um, the due process provision. Uh, where is the due process provision? For example, my question for you was to identify the due process provision. So the due process provision is that the party shall be treated with equality and each party shall be given a full opportunity of presenting his case. Uh, why this is so important in this, um, in this uh, topic? Um, because the due process is very often uh, introduced on the, stage of, uh, on the stage of recognition and enforcement when one of the parties is claiming that is not was not having enough time to prepare for its oral presentation, or it was impossible for them to uh, to fully present uh, your case. This is a very tricky because you are not so sure what is the full opportunity to present in your case. So the standard here is to have a reasonable opportunity to present your own case. There is a there is a famous uh, decision uh, from. Uh, from Australia. I will just give you the decision for access to justice and due process. So if you want, you can, you can read this, uh, this, uh, this case uh, where it was, it was decided that there is no violation of the due process because uh, on the basis that arbitrators are capable to deal with all of their with all of their yes so if you want to read more about this case please go to yeah this is a very recent case where the covid-19 uh, pandemic was also um, involved Yes, uh, and uh, when you can invoke the, the provision, that provision was Article 18 from the Uncitral Model Law. It's the same uh, provision that is already in all arbitrator, uh, arbitration statutes, national, worldwide. So the standard for the full opportunity to present your own case is on the level of reasonable opportunity. The New York uh, Convention that deals with the question of recognition and enforcement, once again, is having some safeguards on the basis of uh, the due process that is based on Article 5.1b, where the party can um, can sort uh, the party can invoke this um, this due process violation as a safeguards towards uh, towards recognition and enforcement, and um, it it is a very interesting to see whether the public policy can also be invoked in this um, in this um, in this area whether there was a public policy safeguard in the place of arbitration or in the place of recognition and enforcement now you will see that um, this um, the ground for the first ground proper notice and each party must be given full opportunity to present your case is uh, not on the substantive uh, nature it should be uh, determined by the arbitral tribunal and uh, the um, the award debtor must present all of the factual situation uh, when you are applying um, when you are applying this uh, standard uh, you need to be very careful on article 6 from the european convention of human rights because many of the national courts now are they're applying direct, directly Article 6 when they're dealing with recognition and enforcement and um, uh, the breach of uh, public, uh, uh, public uh, policy. Uh, I'm very sorry that is, for me it is impossible to finish on time, but I hope that uh, you're having some questions for me and it was interesting for you to listen for arbitration. I know that uh, this is not just like to be in, in person, but once again, we are using the digital technology to present our thoughts on um, arbitration. And uh, if you have some questions, please feel free to ask me. And uh, think about private international law, international commercial arbitration, investment arbitration, because it is a very interesting uh, topic and uh, 
if we are talking about the COVID-19 pandemic, it personally attacked me on the side of arbitration because for me it was impossible uh, to, to travel to, um, to Wismut in Vienna and to Frankfurt yeah, for investment arbitration and also to go to Hungary for uh, William Wiss Primut. So thank you once again. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dopovsky, for your outstanding lecture and your in-depth analysis concerning your topic.